Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for the blessing of your son, Jesus. Thank you for another day that your hands have made. We rejoice and are exceedingly glad. Thank you for another opportunity to show forth your love, Father, because your word is full of love, the love that changes us, grows us up, kills us in some ways, the things that need to die. But that love is so precious, it's worth it all. We love you, honor you, and praise you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Standing on the promises of God. And that's a song. So I'm going to read a little bit of it. It says, standing on the promises of Christ, my king. It's, even though it says God, who is Christ? He's, he's Lord. So through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Glory in the highest. I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. That's true. We, we walk in doubt sometimes. But by the living word of God, I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I now can see. Perfect present cleansing. See, that's that dying mm. in the blood for me. That's how he cleans us up from our sins. Standing in the liberty where Christ makes free. Standing on the promises of God. Old song, but a very valuable song because it's, it's saying what we need to hear and to understand. When we stand, it's like maintaining an upright position. That's what the, the dictionary says, but... I looked at that says maintaining a right position, a righteous position, because if when it's about God, it's got to be righteous, standing on that position and his promises, his assurance that he will do what he says he will do, because he is not a, a man that he would lie. That's scripture. He is God. But one of the most important scriptures to me when I was thinking about this, it was John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That what? That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's the most important promise to me that he could give us eternal life. And that it should be important to you because without that promise, you're like, oh, I'm going to give you ice cream. You're going to have a house. You're going to have a future that's full and rich and bountiful. But eternal life, all those other things are temporary. But eternal life means that when this body, which unfortunately, because of Adam and Eve, is corruptible, is going to fall apart day by day by day. But the spirit that's living within us will live forever. And the life that he gives us is not the life that we can even imagine is full of the presence of God. And that fullness, we will never know until we go home and be with him. But that eternal life could have been eternal life with the enemy. Could have been horrible. But the life that he has given us when we believe in him, and we accept him as our Lord and Savior. It's the beginning of a journey that has a wonderful, and you can't say ending, it has an, a continuance that is richer and much more beautiful than what we're going through now. Because of Adam and Eve, this life here is, is not always that pleasant. I mean, I thank God for my husband and mm. I want to say rescue me, but he didn't rescue me, but he he took me out of singleness and brought me into this marvelous relationship of marriage. But that was all God. That was a promise he gave me. And I didn't even ask for it, but he, he knew what I, I wanted. He knew, he knew what I needed, and he gave me that. So I'm thankful for that. But I am more thankful that as the, the years go by that I know that I will be forever with him i'm he he's with us now but he will always be with us 
And this life that we're living now, that even in that song says, sometimes we have doubts, we have fears, we walk through storms. But when we stand, we, we stand in the righteousness of God in that position. We can weather anything. In 2 Corinthians 1.20, it says, for all the promises of God, find their yes in him. Mac can say, yes, Myra, I'll do this. And he may forget. I might say, yes, Mac, I'll do that. And I might forget. But that, it says, no, all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And because of that, our relationship with God, when we promise each other, mm. Like we're going to obey and honor one another, are committed to one another. We can also say our yes is in him because we make those commitments in him, that marriage commitment. You know, my husband says to me sometimes, I've committed to you. Now, it might be in those times when we're like <laughs> kind of rubbing up against each other. Mm -hmm. And he'll say, no matter what, I'm committed to you. And that's what God says to us. When we accept him, he's committed to us. And when he, what he says to us is always yes in eternal life. It's not that yes that these material things and, and our relationships with people, hopefully the relationships in our marriages will last forever. And I say hopefully because marriages are not always doing well and people do break up. But when we're in Christ, we could we could continue to grow and to mature in the things that he has for us, even in our relationships. But that's a two-way street. But in him, there's no two-way street. Mm -hmm. It says we, mm -hmm. the promises of God find their yes in him. And then that is why it's through him that we utter our amen, amen to God for his glory. Ephesians 6, 10, 11, and 13, the strength of standing. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Our strength is not in ourselves. Our strength is in him. That's why we had to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. There you go, the standing, righteousness against the schemes of the devil. I mean, I hate to say this, but in this political arena, we hear so many different things. We don't know what's true and what's not true because some people in that political arena are, are very adept at lying. It's true. They you know majority of them lie. <laughs> but we can stand in the things of God. And we can stand against the schemes of the devil. We can discern what's right and what's wrong. Because we're going to, that's the enemy. Even working through people, even working through our family members. It's not it's just the politicals. That's Spanish, sorry. But you understand the word. It's in our own families, in our, in our jobs. The enemy can work through whomever he pleases. The people who don't walk in the things of God and don't evaluate even the people of God who don't evaluate the things that they say and the things that they do under the litmus that that light that is Christ because we also need to be aware of how we speak and how we convey to others the truth and not allow the schemes of the devil because he's always after us. Our son mm -hmm. in in Guatemala, Dan, I call him Dan, but it's Angel, Daniel. <laughs> uh, he he's always saying, well, he says it less and less. Thank God. He says, why is the enemy always after me? It's all these things. I said because you have a call on your life, and God has called you to Himself. And the enemy's not not pleased he's there he's a he's alive he's walking this earth his schemes are always present so it continuing in, in ephesians 6 it says therefore take up the whole armor of god that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all 
to stand firm in the righteous position, the righteous position of God, continuing in that admonition of the word of God. Paul is speaking to people who were heathens and sometimes we were heathens too. He said, I'm not a heathen. I wasn't a heathen. Yes, we, yes, you were. I was too. Because heathens are those who walk in the things of the enemy because you're not walking the things of God. It's only, I, I didn't do anything much. Mm. But I was going to hell in a handbasket. My life compared to some other people's lives may have looked good on the outside, but the commitment to him changes everything because I still wasn't dedicated to him. I was dedicated to what I wanted in my life. And it looked good on the outside, but it didn't matter. And when we say a baby in Psalms, it says a baby is born in iniquity. That used to bother me. But that's what the word of God says. Until we commit our lives to him, we're sinners. Mm -hmm. But then we, he brings us out of that darkness into the marvelous light. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And it is a labor because it's a work. It's not like I'm saved, that's it. No, we have to work out our soul salvation with fear and trembling. Because we, you know, like a child is like, my mother told me to do this. My dad told me to do this. But I see that thing. Oh, I see that pie. Oh, I want to go out with my friends. And that's where the fear and trembling is. It's not like, <laughs> no. You know when you're doing wrong, especially if you're a Christian. You know it. And the trembling, the fear and trembling is, it's your spirit fighting against the spirit of the living God that's living within us. Like, I know I'm wrong, but I'm, oh, I, I need to go to that place. I need to listen to that music. I need to eat that extra piece of pie that's not good for me. <laughs> I'm laughing because I went to a, <laughs> oh, not a family, a uh, class reunion. And they, they had, instead of one big cake, they had an array of dessert. And I didn't do well, but I took a little piece of everything, but I still didn't do well. But thank the Lord I'm here today. <laughs> so God forgive me and thank you for keeping me. But he says we can abound in the work of the Lord because that should be our focus. What am I doing for God? And it's not necessarily carrying a big Bible and standing in front of a group of people and preaching the word. What can I do for God? Don't go there. Don't say that. Don't eat that. That's for God because we belong to him. And we even want to in, uh, invite him to be Lord over what we do with our bodies, to maintain it in a way that would honor him. Everything is, should be about God. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I love this scripture because we make so many excuses. Oh, let's just, I'm only human. I'm not perfect yet. But it says no temptation has overtaken you. That's the general you. That's me. That's Mac. That's everyone. That is not common to man. The temptations come. The enemy knows us. <laughs> but God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted. That's a promise beyond your ability. Mm -hmm. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. That's another <laughs> promise that you may be able to endure. it. That's a promise from God. And you know what I used to tell my kids um, in, in, in the ministry? And I used to tell them, you know what that scripture means at the end? What is he providing? The pro he will provide the way of escape. No, that's the way of escape. Say no. Only like, oh, <laughs> it's like, well, I got to go through this. I got to think. No, just say no. Just say no to the temptation. It's not that hard. 
Say the word no. <laughs> and keep on going in the right direction, in the righteous way. Philippians 4 says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. What are our needs? Is it to say our wants? He knows what our needs are. He knows what it what our vulnerabilities are. Because we all have vulnerabilities. We're not perfect yet, but we're working on taking our eyes off of those things that so easily beset us, those things that take us off kilter. I know the other day, I don't know what was going on, uh, but I, I try to walk every day. I do exercises, but I also walk. But this day, I just did not feel good at all. And I was walking, <clears throat> excuse me, and I was, I said, Lord, mm. I know you want me to do this walk. I don't know why I'm feeling this way from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. But I know that I'm going to be able to do this, even if I have to slow down a little bit. And I know whatever's going on in my body, you're just going to have to take care of it. And I had to walk. Because I, I knew it was, I just did not feel I was supposed to stop. And I just kept going. And guess what? I, I, didn't feel, I didn't fall, but I pushed through because I felt in my spirit, he wanted me to, to stand in what I was doing to help me that no we're going to have aches we're going to have pains especially when you get older <laughs> it is part of life but it's not so much about our body it's our spirit that we need to push through in areas that we know are not things that we should be walking in we need to push through stand on the promises that he has given us i love isaiah 61 1 through 3 and this is what Jesus said after he had come out of the out of the desert. It's in Matthews and it's in Luke, but it originally was in Isaiah. So he was repeating part of what was written. And he said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. And he stopped. He said, basically, he said another statement about this is that day and closed the book. But in Isaiah, it continues because that was his call. The anointing was on him to do these things. And we were the poor, we were the brokenhearted, we were the captives, we were the prisoners. It's us that he came and shed his blood for. But the, the third verse just touched my heart. He said, Isaiah spoke this word from the Lord to grant to those who mourn in Zion. Because when I say mourn, I think about this age and this time. There's a mourning going on in the midst of the, the anger and the frustration that you hear every day or you see on on the all the media stuff and on the Facebook and all the the is is a mourning. There's no joy. There's a mourning that's going on in the spirit of man. And only God can heal them. Because it says to give them, this is the um, ESV, is the version. To give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. The garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. That they may be called Oaks, oaks of righteousness, the planning of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And you know, we talk about an oak, and when you say an oak, the first impression you get is this huge tree that stands in the midst of everything. 
Other trees may fall in, but that oak tree will stand forever. But he says he want to call us oaks of righteousness, the planning of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So we stand in the promises of God so that we will be called the oaks of righteousness, the planning of the Lord, but that he may be glorified. Our lives are about his glorification. It's not about us, but we receive the residual blessing. When we bless God, he blesses us. When we honor God, he honors us. When we glorify God, and this is, we have to think through this. He glorifies us, us who are not worthy. He glorifies us. How can that be? We're nothing. But when we put him first, he gives us back so much more mm. than that what we deserve. So people of God stand in the promises of God. Stand in the righteousness. Be that oak in the midst of this morning in this world that others will see, oh, this person is not like others. There's a difference. And it's not our personalities. It's not the way we look. It's not the way we speak. It's the spirit of God that is being glorified and is blessing others and is helping them to understand, I can throw away this morning. Mm -hmm. I can throw away this, this hatred, this anger, and I can walk in the righteousness of God, in his promises. I can stand in the promises of God. Amen. Um, first of all, Maya, that was, that was really good. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> um, so I, I love it when we're coming at things from different aspects of uh, that whole thing about promises. So I'm going to attempt to continue this conversation, uh, but I, I would be remiss since she referenced it at the beginning of her message. Standing on the promises of Christ, my King, through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Yeah, well, it's early, guys, so sorry about that. <laughs> but, but, but here's the thing. Um, as I was looking over the, the lyrics of this hymn, um, I'm going to talk about the background of it because that's what I do. Um, but there are only hints of what those promises are. It's an acknowledgement that there are promises, mm -hmm. but it doesn't actually go into concisely what those promises are so before i start to break that down let's talk about the the writer um who is uh russell kelso carter uh who lived from 1849 to 1928 uh well actually yeah so let me go ahead um was a star athlete of a military academy and an excellent student academically who went on to be a successful 
teacher, and coach. He then spent several years as an ordained Methodist minister, after which he went to medical school. He spent the last of his professional years as a doctor of medicine. Carter was also a musician and songwriter. In 1886, he co-edited Songs of Perfect Love with John Swinney, who wrote the music for such beloved songs as Beulah Land and Feel Me Now. This hymn book included Carter's most famous hymn, Standing on the Promises. Although Carter was a professed Christian most of his life, it wasn't until a crisis with his natural heart that he began to understand the reality and power of Bible promises. At age 30, his health was in critical condition and the physicians could do no more for him. Carter turned to God for help and healing. Praise the Lord for that. He knelt and made a promise that healing or no. And that's the part whether he would be healed or not healed. If we could learn that lesson, <laughs> beloveds, then we might actually be able to write our own standing on the promises mm -hmm. kind of uh, song. But anyway, um, he knelt and made a promise that healing or no, his life was finally and forever fully consecrated to the service of the Lord. It was from that moment that the written word of God became alive to Carter. He began to stand upon the promises of healing, all right, determining to believe no matter what his physical condition, no matter how he felt. Over the course of the next several months, his strength returned and his heart was completely healed. Carter lived another healthy 49 mm -hmm. years, okay? The hymn Carter had written several years before his healing miracle became more than words and music to him. Standing on the promises became an integral part of his life. Now, I want to I want to say this, and I'm not contradicting anything that's been written here because I believe in the the power of prayer for healing and deliverance and all the other things that we attribute to communication with the lord but you know what in all honesty there is no promise of physical healing we know that god can heal we believe that he will heal but there's no guarantee you know, so I would imagine that for, uh, you know, Russell Carter, that it must have been some intense and powerful prayer. And, and remember what is said here, that he consecrated himself to the service of the Lord. So it, it wasn't like he didn't bring anything to the table. So, you know, one of the things that I, I pull away from that is that he was, first of all, uh, uh, renewed or, or, or maybe not so much renewed, but he strengthened his relationship mm -hmm. in the Lord. Okay. Notice he brought that offering that we call it the sacrifice of praise. Mm -hmm. He brought that uh, to the house of the Lord, to the Lord himself. Okay. And the Lord obviously inclined his ear to hear what uh, his servant was uh, praying for and believing in. But I love the fact that he said healing or not, okay? Because that means that your devotion to the Lord is not uh, related in any way to what the Lord is doing for you. It's acknowledging that he is, he is God and in him, there's no failure, which means that if you, what if he didn't get healed? Mm -hmm. 
he would have still been consecrated unto the Lord. He would have still been devoted to the Lord, even in his infirmity, even if that infirmity uh, uh, eventually led to death itself. You know, I think sometimes we live in a world that we think that this natural world is all we've got. And I think that those who are consecrated in God, in Christ, understand that this is the foreplay before the real life that is before him. And when we live our lives in humble adoration and consecration uh, towards God, our Savior, we can then stand on his promises. And so I want to talk about promises from a different point of view than Myra did, um, because I'm going to basically uh, relate it to things that I've read in the New Testament, even though the first thing that I'm going to deal with is in the Old Testament. Interesting enough, she had gone to Isaiah 61. Well, the best promise, guys, uh, <laughs> was uh, actually in Isaiah 53. Uh -huh. Okay, because I'm telling you, this, this, now we know that there was many uh, foretellings of the coming Messiah, uh, but I have to read this in its entirety. I'm looking at my time here, so I'm doing pretty good. Um, but I had to read this in its entirety because again, beloveds, we do not put one little verse out there on the island by itself without understanding that in this case, all of Isaiah 53 is a pronouncement of Jesus Christ himself. And I label this under the promise of Christ mm -hmm. and salvation. Because we're not talking about the promises if we're not talking about Christ right. and we're not talking about salvation. That's our entrance way in. Right. So listen, and, and, and hey guys, again, we come on here to talk about the word. So we're not going to just talk about the word without using the word. So here's the word for you. Isaiah 53 in its entirety from the English Standard Version. It says, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant. Mm -hmm. And like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief as one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Quick uh, stop there. That's probably one of the things that inspired uh Carter in in writing the standing on the promises we we but the healing that's being talked about here is not necessarily a physical healing we're talking about the healing of the soul okay which is way more important than the natural body let me continue anyway it says all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned every one to his own way mm. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is God saying, Jesus, I'm giving you all of the iniquity, all of the sin, all of the things I despise. And even though you are the innocent lamb that I brought to the world in the form of human flesh, you are going to take on all of the wickedness, all of the uh, the 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 evilness, all of the iniquity of the world forever. Mm -hmm. 
You understand forever. All right. Anyway, it says he was oppressed and he was uh, afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth by oppression and judgment. He was taken away and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, though he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth yet it was the will of the lord to crush him he has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt he shall see his offspring he shall prolong his days the will of the lord shall prosper in his hands out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with many, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. The promise, y'all, the promise is that this Messiah, this Savior, this Lord, this King, this Prince of Peace, Jesus was coming. Literally, Isaiah has laid out the groundwork, everything that truly mattered, everything that we would see fulfilled in the new covenant. God, through Isaiah, gave us the promise that this man was coming. And because he came, we can then go to where Myra was in uh, whether you read from the account in Isaiah 61 or you go over to Luke, mm -hmm. notice that, man, when you get to Luke, you don't have to deal with the acceptable year of the Lord because the acceptable year of the Lord was here through him. That's one of the main differences. He didn't have to say that because the Lord was here in the new covenant and he is here now in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so the promise that God has given us, just, just I haven't even finished yet, but just off the bat, is that this Messiah, this Christ, this Lord, this Savior is coming. He would be despised. He would be wounded. He would take on all of the iniquity, all of the sin of the world. He would be despised and rejected. Yet he did this because of his love for us. If you don't have any other promise related to you this morning, stand on that because that is the foundation from which we have life and our very being to this very day. I get excited about this. Thing. Yes, I do. Because this is this is the real deal, y'all. This is, you know, you know, when we're standing on the promises of God, the promise was the Messiah. If, if we don't have that promise, we might as well not talk about anything else. So along with that, we also get the promise of the Holy Spirit. All right. Uh, John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17 says this. If you love me, conditional, mm -hmm. if you love me. So this is not for everybody. Look, this is an exclusive club, y'all. If you love me. Many people will say they love God out of their mouth. I, I can't, I can't let it go. Oh, you know where I'm going. <laughs> okay. We, we heard about it, uh, just a few days ago where at a particular rally, 
a particular man in the crowd says, Jesus is Lord. Mm. To which the response was, you got the wrong rally. So again, <laughs> you guys, you've got to understand there are people that simply hate God. They might make it look good. They might change their their way of, of saying things in order to fit agendas. Yeah, they might do that. But ultimately, when you cry out, Jesus is Lord, and they say, get up out of here. Hmm. Okay. They have said they hate God. Okay. That's what they have said. I don't care where you fall on the political uh, plumb line. That is hating God. And what was worse is the number of people mm -hmm. who co-signed it. All right. But I guarantee you, many of them would profess they love God. So if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And we're supposed to acknowledge him in all of our ways. And that way he will direct our paths. Look at that. Janae is in the house. Anita, all the way from Chikimula. Nope, she's in the United States. Oh, she's in the U.S. Amen. Praise God. Well, she's here with us. Praise God. Anyway, let me continue. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Which means that if there's another helper, then obviously mm. there was already a helper. All right. And that would be him himself. All right. I'll say he gives you another helper to be with you forever, forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. You understand what we're saying here? That goes back to the writer of the hymn. He, he said that he consecrated his self for the service of the Lord. That is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You can't make a move. You can't utter a sound without the acknowledgement that the spirit of truth mm -hmm. is alive in you. That's why you cannot do certain things, be beloveds and believers, because there are just certain things that a person who is a follower of the way simply would not do. And because of this, you guys, he gives us the promise of his Holy Spirit. We know that that promise manifested itself in Acts chapter 2, it with the introduction being with a mighty Russian mm. wind that literally in the same manner or like manner that God initially breathed into us the breath of life and man became a living soul. Well, that doesn't talk about spirit yet. That just gave man a conscious. Okay. But in Acts chapter two, with the introduction of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, God basically breathed into us his spirit. And that spirit, for those of us who love God, is with us forever. My God, standing on those promises of Christ, our Savior. My goodness. Then we have the promise of understanding the mystery of Christ. Oh my goodness. So let's go to the scriptures. Ephesians chapter three. I cannot escape Ephesians. Everything that I'm sharing, it seems involves Ephesians in some way, but Ephesians chapter three, verses one through six, listen to this. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of of you Gentiles. Again, just to give clarity, he's speaking to the Gentiles to basically let them know that by golly, we have the same promise mm. that was given to the Jews. 
So anyway, it says, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations. And going back to the, the Israelites, it wasn't known. All right. Okay. Uh, let's see where I lost my place, which was made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Man, do you understand? You have literally just been revealed or, or the, the, the mystery of Christ has been revealed in the fact that the promise, guys, is that we can share at the same table as God's chosen. We come in by adoption, but we're treated as natural born believers in Christ. We, we, we eat from the same table. We drink from the same cup, the cup of his blood that was shed for us. My God, that's the mystery. How could that happen? Because we were outside of the promise that was given to Israel, yet we are partaking in the same benefits that have come from that promise. So when the writer says, I'm standing on the promises of God, we are literally standing on equal footing with those who God had handpicked from the very beginning to be his people. Now we also are grafted in as his people. And similar to our situation, Myra and I, who she brought one natural born daughter into our marriage. I brought two natural born uh, children into our marriage, but we have two Guatemalan children, well, they're not children anymore, but they are to us, but we brought two in by adoption, but we don't treat them any different than we treat our own. You understand what we're saying here? I mean, when since Angel is probably still on here, I talk to him as my son, which means I get in his grill sometimes as a father would to his son because I love him enough to make sure that he's doing things properly. Same with our daughter, Amy. I love her, but I'm not taking stuff off of her because I am her father and Myra is her mother and we are sent here to treat them no different than uh, Lily her natural born daughter, or my children, Lewis and Naomi. They all are treated the same way. They all have access to us in the same manner. And that's what God is saying here. That's the mystery. The mystery has been solved, y'all. We are part of the party. We are part of the heavenly host. We have access and can look upon God in those days when we are no longer in this nasty, stinking, filthy flesh, and we can now look at our God, our creator, our Lord, and we can see him face to face, just like our Jewish brethren. I see you, Stanley. God bless you. Now, look, that's not the only promise, all right? There is the promise of entering into the Sabbath rest of God. We know that six days God was in the creative mode and on the seventh day he rested. All right. 
Well, listen to this in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. It says, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. I saw this, Myra, and I said, glory, glory unto God Almighty. God did his work in six days. Now, his whatever six days means to God, we know that we have a finite amount of days to do the work of the Lord here on earth. But God has given us a promise and that promise is that we can enter into that same Sabbath rest that he took, a rest that will allow us to no longer have to push and struggle and, 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 and climb and pursue all the things of this world. We have evangelized for the Lord. We have prayed you know, unto the Lord. We have ministered and encouraged folk who are downtrodden. We have clothed folks who needed clothing. We have given food and drink to those who were thirsty and hungry. And eventually that work will cease and we will be in a state of rest where we no longer have to labor and struggle and pursue these things because God has given us a more excellent way in his presence. He's given us this promise, y'all, that the work don't last always, that eventually we can rest in him. And in fact, honestly, you can rest in him now, mm -hmm. all right? But eventually all of our labor will be proven to not be in vain mm. because we now are resting in the bosom of God. My God. Myra, I tell you, <laughs> I'm almost done, y'all. I'm almost done because we got to get out of here. Uh, but let me just cap this thing off. I mean, there are thousands of promises. I, I got, my mind was just, got dizzy after a while. I said, okay, Lord, wait a minute. Where do we go with this? You know, how do we condense this in a way that our audience can, can grasp those things that are most important? And that's how God took me in this direction to just hear what the Bible has to say about the promises that we need the most. Mm -hmm. We need to have salvation. We we must be saved, okay? We must have the Holy Spirit indwelt in us. We must also be able to rest in the comfort of God's rest. And because he rested, so we can rest. And that, my beloveds, is standing on the promises of God we want to acknowledge the writer of the hymn. He just set things up. You know, again, his story was one that God healed him from an infirmity of the heart. And we believe that, but God does not promise us that we will be healthy in this life. Okay. But he does promise that we can be healed of, in our soul. And that can can be eternal. We know that I, I always think about Paul. Paul keeps talking about, you know, there's this, the thorn and we don't know what the thorn was, but we have to think it's an infirmity of some sort. All right. And we actually should rejoice in those infirmities. I'm going to be straight up with you guys as we close out. Right now, my back is killing me, okay? I, I, I 
have been working out and lifting weights. And I did a move the other day and I realized as soon as I did it, it was one of those full body thing with weights. And I realized as soon as I did it, I could, I felt something pop and I said, oh, I did it to myself. And now I'm dealing with that. But the thing is, is that whether this pain stays with me or whether it finally goes away, I'm standing on the promise of the healing that God has promised me eternally. So anything that I might be dealing with or that Myra might be dealing with or what you guys might be dealing with, it pales in comparison to the glorious eternal rest and healing that will take place because God has promised that mm -hmm. for us. We pray that there's something that has been said that has encouraged you. We believe in the no nonsense gospel. You know, we, we pray that, that we address things that you need to hear. And honestly, if you have suggestions, reach out to us. We want to talk about what you guys want to talk about. Know that we love you and we thank you for spending your Sunday morning before you're headed to your worship services. Thank you for spending that time with us. Uh, with that said, God bless you and God keep you in his perfect peace with our minds stayed on Jesus. Amen. Bye-bye.